Today we're going to explore some of the myths about your truck that you may have never thought about before. And we're going back into the Truck U lab. Hey, welcome to Truck U. I'm Bruno Massel. Underside this Toyota Tacoma today because we're going to do some routine maintenance in the form of changing the oil. Now, believe it or not, something as simple as an oil change sparks a lot of questions from you guys at home. And uh, first one is the difference between regular and synthetic oil. So let's start at the beginning with the regular oil. Now, if you've got an older vehicle, you've been running regular oil in it probably if it's 10 years older or longer. Now, there's nothing wrong with it, but you do have a better option these days in the form of synthetic motor oil. People come in and say, well, I've been running traditional oil, can I switch to synthetic? And yes, you can. The thing is, you want to make sure that you drain out all the traditional oil and then throw in the synthetic. Once you go to synthetic, you do have the option of going back, so you can go from one to another and back and forth. That's not a problem. The thing is, you really don't want to mix the two together because the oils have different properties and they might not mix well inside of your engine. Now, synthetic oil is better in the fact that it's got better oil lubricating uh, capabilities to it. It does a better job of clinging to your engine parts and lubricating them better. The thing is, traditional oil, they tell you to change it every three to 5,000 miles, and manufacturers will tell you, or car manufacturers, that you, you want to change it three to 5,000 miles no matter what oil you're using. Well, common sense says that if the oil's not breaking down as much and it's doing a better job of lubricating, which synthetic does, you can go up to twice as long between your oil changes. So instead of every three to 5,000 miles, you can go six to 10,000 miles without changing the oil. Now, it does cost a little more up front, okay, so you're going to have to shell out a few more bucks initially, but you go longer time between intervals, so that's going to save you money, and the time involved in doing it is going to be cut in half. So, believe it or not, synthetic seems to be a better option to go with. I love the big pad. Now let's talk about viscosity. What is it? Viscosity is a rating given to oil that measures the rate at which the oil flows. But when you're looking at it, if you don't know what these numbers mean, it can be a little bit overwhelming. 5W30, 10W40, SAE30, SAE40. What's that all about? Well, let's take a look at this. You've got the single grade oil, which is your SAE oils. Let's say a SAE30, SAE40. That's your viscosity, this 30 and 40, at operating temperature of the vehicle, which is taken at about 210 degrees. Fahrenheit 100 degrees Celsius. That's your simulated driving temperature and that's where this viscosity is taken. Now you move up here to the 5W30s, 10W40s, that's a multi-grade multi oil right there. That's doing two different things where your SAEs, your, your measurements only taken at operating temperature. This is taken at startup, that's why it's blue because that's when the engine's cold and the red over here at operating temperature. So a 5W30 is actually acting like two different oils. It's acting like an SAE5 when it's cold at startup and an SAE 30 at operating temperature. So like I said, it's doing a couple different things. Now, you will hear people say, don't use a 5W30 because it's too thin. Well, too thin for what? You actually want it thin when it's starting up, especially if you're in a really cold climate and it's zero degrees out there. You want it thin at startup, and then you've got an SAE 30 when it's at operating temperature, because if the engine has to work hard to get this oil thinned out to get it going through the engine, it's actually going to run dry, and that's going to give you some premature engine wear. So don't worry about that. Your 5W30 is going to be good. It's going to start up nice and thin and then act like an SAE 30 once it's up to operating temperature. Now, I know there's a couple guys out there with white coats and some cool glasses that are saying, Matt, there is so much more to viscosity than what you've just said. But you know what? For 99.9% .9 of us out there, you know this is startup, this is operating temperature, and 5W30 is going to be fine for most of the vehicles that are out there driving on the road. And that's all most of us need to know. Matt, you believe it, I was actually paying attention to your little tutorial on oil. I got some 5W30. I think that should be good for this thing. I'm just glad you were paying attention. That's a switch. You know? hey, one, one last thing you guys at home is, yes, you do need to change your filter every time you change your oil. Good call. Now that we've got the hood open like this, 
Let's actually talk about belt technology and how it's changed over the years for just a minute or two because this is actually pretty interesting. You go back to the old school, you had the old V-belts and they would actually break after a while and come apart. Right about the 70s, they went with the serpentine neoprene belt. Those lasted a lot longer. One of the nice things about them was when they got worn out, you could actually look at the belt and see all the cracks and it would tell you, hey man, it's time to change me, right? Actually, we've seen, we've seen them in much worse condition than this. So you put that aside, right around 2000, they went with the EPDM style belt. These lasted a lot longer, but the only catch was it was harder to tell when the belt needed to be changed. What you needed to do was get a little tool like this, and then that way you could check it. Yeah, with the neoprene belts, you're, about, you're getting about every 50 to 60,000 miles was time to go ahead and change them. Now with the new EPDM ones, got a lot more wear out, about 80,000 miles. Like Matt was saying though, the wear pattern's hard to see visually, which made the inspection, which makes the inspection a little bit more cumbersome. So that's where this comes into play is the fact that it's hard to see it because it's upside down with a little tool, you can feel it and that's the difference. Right, if you have the new belt right here versus the worn one right here and you've got a little cutaway chunk, sure it's easy to tell the difference between the two, but when it's on the vehicle and you see it like that, yeah, it can be a little bit more challenging. So when you look at this and you lay the tool in, basically we're gonna lay this tool right into the groove. So there's the new belt. We lay that tool on there, you can feel with your thumb there that that's resting right on top of the grooves. You can tell, you can feel the tool. On this old worn belt, you lay that in there and you don't feel a thing. So if it's upside down and you can't see it or you're looking off to the side like that, you don't even know what's in there and that means that it's time to change the belt. Now the problem with having deeper, wider grooves in that EPDM belt is the fact that you're not going to have as much surface area as you have with all those accessories that are being driven off it. Case in point being your alternator. It'll cause it to slip and won't spin as fast as it normally would, won't keep your battery charged. The end result for you and I is the fact that, well, you're stuck on the side of the road with a dead battery. That's never a good thing. That's not good at all. We're going to talk about batteries in just a second when we come back from break. So let's get this finished up and then let's talk some cold cranking amps. You did put those other quartz in, right? Yeah, I threw them over there to the side. I mean, it's not my truck. Welcome back to Truck U. So if you're out there shopping around for a battery and you don't live in a tropical climate, one of the most important things you want to look for is the cold cranking amps of the battery. Very important. Yeah, now what it is, it's a rating used by the battery industry to describe the battery's ability to start an engine in the cold. Now scientifically what they do <laughs> is they put the battery at zero degrees and they put it under load for 30 seconds. They want to see the voltage not drop below 7.2, right? And that's going to determine what the cranking amps are, the cold cranking amps are, the battery. So we figured we do a little science of our own, right? We had this battery laying around, nothing brand new. We didn't just go charge it up or anything. It's just been sitting around, but it's a good battery. And we sat it in this bag of dry ice to get it nice and cold. Now let's just see, hypothetically speaking, what did we, we get it cold enough? Minus 59 degrees. That is ridiculously cold. Yeah, That's like not, where you're from. We're not playing around here. <laughs> before we gave this battery the deep freeze, we went ahead and got a baseline for it at room temperature. So before we dropped it in, this thing had 400 amps. Yeah. Now I got a feeling it's gonna be a little bit less than that. Let's give it a little load here. Let's see what we got. We're doing all right though. The fact that it's still doing anything at minus 60 degrees is pretty impressive. What are you down to about 120? So yeah, you can see the difference that temperature has on a battery and how the cold just sucks the life out of it. Now, there's another type of battery, a deep cycle battery that sometimes people may make the mistake of in putting it in their everyday driver. The, the problem with that is besides the fact that Matt can't blow smoke on it, <laughs> is that it doesn't have that burst when you go to hit the start or what it is, it's made for like a long term where it'll be in your RV or in your boat, something right. like that where you're gonna use a continuous pull for a long period of time. Purchasing a set of tires these days can be a bit challenging. You've got a ton of different manufacturers you've got to pick from, and you've got to be able to figure out a whole lot of gibberish here to tell you about speed ratings and overall widths and uh, rim sizes and all that stuff. Now, in its simplest form, you deal with a big truck tire like this. It'll tell you right here on the sidewall. It's a 37 by 12 and a half by 17. And you're talking about a 37 inch tall tire, that's 12 and a half inches wide on a 17 inch wheel. Pretty straightforward. For most of us though, you've got a, a crossover or a light duty truck or a, a passenger car and you've got to deal with a whole metric system. So these two different tires here are similar, but different. They're both similar in the fact that they run on a 20 inch wheel and that's what these numbers stand for. The difference is the fact that this is a 245 and you're talking about the, the tread width of the tire versus a 255. The 255 is going to be taller. The higher the number, the wider the tire. Now the 45 here in the lettering, that means it's an aspect ratio of the sidewall to your tread width, and they're both 45s. 
Now here's the other thing. They're both high performance tires in that they're Z rated for speed, meaning they can go in excess of 149 miles an hour. Now beyond that, they got a different rating number, which will tell you that this W and this Y means that a W rated tire is gonna be a good for 168 miles an hour, and a Y is the bad boy, 186. Now that's way faster than you ever need to go, especially in a truck but I figured I'd break it all down for you because those guys over in Europe on the Autobahn tend to get a little crazy and that's why they took this rating a little bit farther. One last thing for you here is that this 99, that's the load index of the tire. The higher the load index, the more weight capacity these tires can handle. So that's the 411 on the tires. I know it's a lot to digest, but a little bit more on wheels. Let's check in with Matt over in the Shell Lab. Today in the lab, our assignment is Blackmagic Titanium Wheel Cleaner. There are a lot of different wheel cleaners on the market, but you want to make sure that you're using the right one for your application because some of them can actually do more harm than good. A simple way to tell if you're using the right product is with a pH test. You remember that from the old science classes, right? You can pick up these little pH strips at any little scientific shop or an arts and crafts store, and this is a great way to test the pH level of the cleaners that you're going to use. Now, we did this little test in some tap water a little bit earlier that came out perfectly perfectly neutral. You want to make sure ideally that your cleaner is going to be as neutral as possible too. That way it's not too acidic or too alkaline. So we'll run the test real quick here first on the Black Magic. Now that comes out as you can see nice and neutral. That's right in the middle. That's right where we want it to be. So we check some of the other products on the market. We'll check this one and take a look. Now that one's coming back a little bit on the acidic side right there. You put that down and that could be a little bit too acidic for certain applications. We'll go down to the next one and check it out. Oh, there we go. That's nice and blue. That pegs the scale all the way down on the alkaline side. So keep in mind, this is a nice little easy test. You can take a look at that and say, look, this one might be a little too acidic for these wheels. That one might be a little too alkaline for those wheels. But the Black Magic Titanium Wheel Cleaner is good and safe for all wheels. Another little test you can do to illustrate the effects of the cleaning agents on the metal is to do what we did here. We took these little aluminum strips and slid them in there and let them sit for about 24 hours. Now we can check and see what's going on. You take a look at this with the tap water and the black magic titanium right there, no effect because they're totally neutral. That's exactly how you want it to be. We'll come down here and check the rest of them too. And we look down here and you can see there is a whole bunch going on and that could be bad for your wheel. The one that's a little too acidic, that could actually eat away at the metal and the one that's real alkaline, that's gonna give it a scale. You don't want either one of those things going on. Now let's face it, when you're spraying the wheel down and you're gonna clean it, odds are pretty good you're not gonna get it all off and you might actually leave some on there. Well, you'd be better off leaving a neutral cleaner on there because as you can see, it's not gonna hurt the metal. If you leave one of these other ones on for a week at a time, who knows what's gonna be happening to your wheel. So it's very important that you have a neutral cleaner right here just like the black magic titanium wheel cleaner and that is exactly how you do it and now we know how it works and today's assignment is done perfect you are the man. Hey, welcome back to Truck Key. We talked a lot about tire sizes. One thing we didn't talk about was tire pressure. Now, how do you know the right tire pressure for your vehicle? Well, owner's manual is a good one to go by, or there's a sticker on the inside of your door jam will tell you. Now, if you switch to aftermarket tires, though, probably best bet is to ask the dealer you got them from. If you didn't, he'll tell you on the side the max pressure for the tire, and you want to check it always when the tire is cold. So a good rule of thumb, check your tires first thing in the morning after it's been sitting overnight. Now, there's a big hype these days about switching to nitrogen in your tires versus compressed air. The question is why? Well, there are a couple of advantages to running nitrogen in your tire. And without getting too involved in the periodic table of elements and without getting too scientific, we'll go over three of them right now. First of all, number one is the fact that the nitrogen is going to stay in the tire longer and keep that in inflation pressure constant longer. It's not going to dissipate through the tire because even if the tire is good and doesn't leak, you'll notice that over time that compressed air and oxygen is going to escape the tire. 
Now, the advantage of that is they say that nitrogen is going to give you better fuel economy. It's not necessarily because of the nitrogens in the tire, but the tire is properly inflated. Now, secondly, there is no moisture. So when you put in the nitrogen, it's nice and dry because you put the compressed air in that tire, no matter what, no matter how clean and dry that air is, there is some water vapor going in there. And thirdly, this is really the biggest one, is the fact that the nitrogen is not as susceptible to temperature changes. Let's say you're hauling a trailer. This is a good example here with the little tiny trailer tires yep. going down the road and they're spinning four or five times faster. Those babies are getting hot. They're spinning fast and that pressure is building up and you're really working that tire. That's why you see so many of those blown out on the side of the road. That's why when you put on the little donut tire, the little spare, it says don't go over 40 or 45, right. whatever it is on that. That's exactly why they don't want you doing that. So with the nitrogen in there, you don't have those wild temperature changes and that's just another advantage to running the nitrogen. Welcome back to Truck U. You know, anytime you're working on a vehicle, you are going to get your hands dirty. And if you want to keep these babies clean and looking and feeling good, you want to use the right products. And that's what it's all about here today with the line from Stoco Skin Care. This is the Cresto Heavy Duty Hand Cleaner and the Cresto Skin Repair. You know, Matt, a few years ago, a buddy of mine at the races introduced me to the hand cleaner. It's something I swear by ever since. I've got my own personal stash back at the shop in the trailer. It's like when I use this stuff when I really want to get the grit, all the grease off, you know. It's got these little walnut scrubbers in it. It'll get all the dirt off from underneath your nails. So when you go out with your buddy, you go out your wife and you want to look like, well, you don't want to look like you're working on your car all day. This is the stuff to use. Right. Now, this is the skin repair. Let's say you're working a lot and your skin's getting dried out and a little bit damaged. Man, you just put a little bit of that in there and just rub it in. It's non-greasy. It's going to keep your skin hydrated and looking and feeling good. And that is what it's all about because it's going to keep you working longer. It's the Cresto Heavy Duty Hand Cleaner and Skin Repair. Now here's something that can really come in handy if you're one of two guys. Either you're a guy that's going to pull a trailer or you're an individual that's going to put your vehicle in reverse, right? That's pretty much everybody watching. We understand that. It's the master lock, hitch alignment, and vehicle backup camera. And this is cool. Yeah, this is cool because it's really functional. Now, first of all, it can work as a safety device. It'll mount right into your trailer hitch like that. The pin will hold it. It's really discreet. And you'll be able to see what's going on behind you. You won't hit anyone. You won't hit anything, which is a good thing. Right. Now, if you're using it for towing applications, it'll mount on the back of your truck or vehicle like this. And this so you can see the pins, so you don't have to have someone out there eyeballing for you. You don't have to back up and forth 15 times. It's a nice system. Now, we've heard guys talk about backup cameras, and they said, yeah, that sounds great, but it sounds like a lot of wiring, and I don't want to get involved in all that mess, right? Those days are over because this is a completely wireless system. you got the little antenna right there, and it sends the wireless feed up to the display unit that you've got inside the cab. Now, it's real easy because this plugs into your existing wiring harness. That's already there, and then your trailer plugs right into the back of that, so it goes right into the system, sends it all up wirelessly to the cab, and you are rolling and you are seeing where you're going. And that's the name of the game, man. It's the Master Lock Hitch Alignment and Vehicle Backup Camera, and it doesn't get any easier. If you're working on a Chevrolet truck, more specifically an older one, and you've got a hard to find part and you're wondering where you're going to get it, well, that's where these guys come in. It's Classic Parts of America with their catalogs for Chevy trucks. Now, they've got six catalogs out there, and they range from 1947 going all the way up to 1998. It basically gives you anything you want for a Chevy truck. If you're looking for a little doodad, something like this, and you don't know where to find it, they'll find it inside here. And these catalogs are nice looking as well. I mean, it almost serves as like, you know, a coffee table right. book. You know, they've got great diagrams inside. You can find all the parts you're looking for, and you can get them to your quickly. These catalogs are free and you can get the parts online as well with the guys from Classic Parts of America and their catalogs of parts for Chevy trucks. Today we've had a scientific theme going on. We're going to continue on with that theme with a little bit of an experiment to show you guys what happens inside your fuel system with buildup. So with MP Green and my beautiful assistant Matthew, we're going to simulate that experiment right here. I think, technically speaking, I'm the one that did the experiment, so you would be the assistant. I'm kind of calling the shots. Right, let's just go. Way, right? Here's what we did. First of all, we took these two tubes and put an equal amount of diesel fuel in each one. Not much, just enough to cover the bottom. Then I added 10 drops of H2SO4 to each one of the tubes right there. And we shook it up a little bit to simulate sulfur deposits in your fuel system, and you can kind of see what's going on on the sides right there. Yeah, it's actually clinging to your injectors. Well, it'll clog your injector, and it'll, it'll hamper the performance of your engine, so that's not a good thing. So what we're going to do is we're we're going to add brand X to Bruno's solution right there and MP Green to mine over here and show you the difference of how it is. So go ahead and fill it up about halfway there. Okay, Bruno. I can do that. And I'll try not to spill too about much. halfway? Yeah, right around there. All right, that's pretty good. So we do a little uh, oop, driving simulation? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So you're driving down the road. 
All right, let's see. I'll take a look at that. Hmm, yours a little a bit clearer than mine, I'd That say. is restored, there's no junk on the side, and that's what it's gonna do for your fuel system right there. It's gonna keep it nice and clean throughout the whole system, which is gonna have a lot of benefits for your vehicle. Yeah, you know, what it's gonna do is, by having a clean fuel system, it's gonna have a clean burn, so if you're burning clean fuel, you're gonna save in a fuel economy, and they'll claim up to six to 8% better fuel economy just by using MP Green. Now, you're also gonna get lower EGTs, up to 200 degrees lower, which means it's gonna be easier on your entire engine because lower EGTs mean that you're gonna have better fuel economy so you'll not only get better fuel economy but it'll be easier on your engine and don't forget mp green is available for gas and diesels i love science man these things are fun takes me back to high school for more information on anything you've seen on today's show check out speedtv.com or visit our website at truckutv.com Welcome back to Truck U. Now today what we've been doing is sort of paying a little bit of attention to some frequently asked questions or some frequently misunderstood things about your vehicle. Yeah, we've covered a number of different things, you know, from the basics, from reading tires and getting tire sizes to stuff like myths underneath the hood when right. you're talking about radiators. Now, one thing that people obviously make a mistake on times is buying gasoline, something so simple. They think that, well, if I buy a higher rate of gasoline, I'm doing myself a favor. You know, I'm really going to, I'm going to treat my engine. I'm going to give it right. more life or I'm going to clean the injectors by running a 91 when I'm recommended to run an 87. All you're really doing is basically burning money. And you're treating the suits back at corporate right there because they're making more money off of it. Yeah, there's some misconceptions about that too. They think uh, that the higher octane gas is cleaner which it's really not, or that the higher octane gas is going to burn faster, which is actually the opposite. Now, what it is, is a higher octane gasoline has a slower burn rate. Like, let's take this Tacoma, for instance. You look in the manual, it'll tell you it needs 87 octane gasoline. So if you run a 91 octane gasoline, you're not hurting the engine, but you're just wasting your money. So if it, the case was flipped, though, where it's saying it needed a 91 octane gasoline, like this had a higher compression engine in it, you ran 87, you'll start noticing you'll have a knocking or pinging. That is your dead giveaway that you need to bump up the octane. If you don't do it, have a slower burn rate for that fuel to burn in, you will do damage to your engine. That's a problem. So like your Ferrari, you're probably going to want to use something more than the 87. <laughs> yeah. The 96 Ranger, however, though, the real vehicle, I notice that knocking and pinging if I'm pulling a trailer or something like that. You see what I've done over the last 15 years with that truck is actually create a higher compression engine because of the carbon buildup on the walls. <laughs> so sometimes I've got to use a higher octane gasoline to get the job done. You know, it's a little custom creation that I did. Right. But if you're doing some towing or something like that and you notice a little knocking and pinging, you throw in a little octane booster and that's a quick fix right there. Yeah. So do yourself a favor. You don't waste your money on things you don't need to. Go by the manufacturer's spec and you're usually going to be okay. Words to live by. Good show. A lot of knowledge. We're out of time and we'll see you guys next week. Nicely done, dude.